Brian Stevens with the National Real Estate Post. So we have all heard the story about systemic racism in residential appraising. There have been a handful of cases where it's been determined that appraisers have brought appraisals in low based on the homeowner's race. Now, I don't know if this is true, and you don't know if this is true. We don't know the value, the comps, the adjustments, the neighborhood, or the appraiser. So for me to chime in and say that these appraisals had an inherent racial bias would be foolish. I simply don't know. It is one of two things, right? Either they did or they didn't. Now here's what I think. When we use words like systemic, that means that the entire residential appraisal profession has a racial bias. For me, this is a fairly new topic. I haven't heard about it in appraising. As far as I can tell, a portion of our industry has decided that systemic racism in appraising exists based on three fairly well-known cases. Again, I don't know the details. My thinking is this though. I think it's irresponsible to use words like systemic or make accusations about an entire industry where individuals who may be pure of heart are accused of deeds for which they are not guilty. Perhaps. Question, were these bad appraisals? If they were, were they isolated or is this systemic? What about other appraisals that consumers, lenders, or realtors disagree with of clients that are of other ethnicities? Do these bad appraisals carry an inherent bias or are they just bad appraisals or are they the right appraisal and you just don't like the value? Again, I don't know and you don't know. My thinking is this, before we pigeonhole an entire industry with easy and cheap terms like systemic, a word that is wildly misallocated under the circumstance, a word for which there is zero evidence to support, I would suggest that our industry start with a word like comprehensive. Is there systemic racism in appraising? Let's find out. Let's conduct a comprehensive, non-partisan study of the industry as a whole. Then and only then can we draw a conclusion and make the corrections if it is determined that they are needed in the first place. Until we use terms like comprehensive, casting judgment, making accusations, feel more partisan and agenda driven than anything else. Again, please hear what I'm saying. Keep the knives in your belt and out of my path. I'm just saying let's find out before we find fault. Now on a separate note, the FHFA commissioned an FHA staff working paper series, A Quarter Century of Mortgage Risks. I know it sounds exciting, I mean I agree with you guys. Here's the deal, as far as I can tell and asserted in these papers, this is the first comprehensive, there's that word again, comprehensive study of mortgage risk over the past 25 years. It goes through 2019, early 2020. Now I will be sharing insight on this on the Frank Ray and Brian Stevens Facebook page with live videos on Facebook. So if you wanna check it out, you wanna go there. Now the reason is, this sucker is really eating an elephant. It's massive and it appears to be a pretty big knot to untie. So again, my thinking, the FHFA's recent narrative and future decision making is going to be based almost wholly on risk mitigation. That's everything that we've seen over the past couple of months and a number of policy changes that have been made with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the loans that they're going to be buying and insuring are going to be based on risk mitigation. In short, this paper is probably going to have big ramifications on the direction of about half of the loans that you write. For example, Example, the enterprises represent a massive 62% of all originations as of the second quarter of 2020. Since 2002, they had a low of 39% of the market and a high of 64%, meaning no meaningful conversation about the health of the mortgage and real estate industry can happen without first figuring out what in the heck is going on with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So we are going to try to decipher this together again on the Frank Ray and Brian Stevens Facebook page with live discussions that I get it, yuck might go about about an hour long each, so check it out there. Again, this is going to help you with your decision making in terms of what you're doing with your mortgage and origination business as we go forward. This is a real big one, guys. So make sure you jump onto the Frank Gray and Brian Stevens Facebook site. Finally, two million folks are in forbearance. Finally, two million folks are in forbearance right now. Mortgages in forbearance fell for the 15th consecutive week last week to 4.04% of servicers portfolio volume, a 12% basis point decline according to a survey from the Mortgage Bankers Association. As of June 6th, the Mortgage Bankers Association
Association now estimates 2 million borrowers are still in some form of forbearance. Here's the big question. How many of them are out of forbearance? Here's the big question. How many of these who are out of forbearance are in modifications or are not making their payments? Or in general, how many people who left forbearance actually have loans that are performing? As the forbearance period starts to wind down, these numbers will avail themselves to us and it will be a change in the landscape of lending and real estate as we know it. Realtors, your inventory, it's on the way. Lenders, your refi to purchase ratio is going to change. Are you guys ready for it? Because I'm going to pop some corn because the second half of 2020 is gonna be one hell of a show in real estate and lending. Listen, if you liked what we talked about today, do me a favor, forward and share it and keep this discussion going. Any questions that you guys might have or any statements you wanna make, share them in the comments down below or hit the contact us button up above. With that said, I can't wait to see you guys again here tomorrow on the National Real Estate Post. Bye.